Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Once more with feeling. All right, here we are. It's yeah. great to see you all for our last lecture of this wonderful cruise. Have you been having a good time on this cruise? Yeah. I knew that was a silly question to ask. It's been my pleasure to be able to be with you during this time. And for our last talk of uh, the trip, we want to look at Greece, birthplace of Western culture. This is not nearly the stem winder that some of my talks have been. I sort of feel like we're not going out with a bang but a whimper, but uh, it's only appropriate <laughs> since we're, we're approaching Greece, actually. We're in the Greek islands somewhat now. Um, but I do want to talk about Greece because not only are we visiting there, earlier on when we talked about religions, um, it, we talked about the birth of ethical monotheism in the Hebrew religion, the Jewish religion, and there are two primary sources to Western culture as we know it. The Hebrew concept of ethical monotheism and of the dignity of all human beings. The Jewish faith uh, says that all people are made in the image of God, and therefore all people have an inherent dignity, whether they're rich or poor, whatever their circumstance. All people have dignity inherently, and therefore um, we need to treat one another well. That's where the ethical monotheism comes from. That is the spiritual and religious foundation for Western culture. The second foundation or principle of Western culture is based upon Greek. Greek rationality, Greek intellectual pursuits, and the culture that they develop. So the Hebrew religion, the Greek intellect, science, and culture, those two together have formed the foundation for what we are as a Western civilization. So I want to talk about that a little bit in the next hour. As we talk about uh, Greek culture, we have to start with the two civilizations that preceded the Greek culture. I've, I've mentioned these before. The first one is the oldest of the European civilizations, which is the Minoan culture, which developed on the island of Crete. If you ever have a chance to go to Crete and see some of the ruins and things there, they're quite spectacular. The date that we show here for the Minoan culture is 1700 to 1450 BC. That was the period in which they flourished most. But the Minoan culture actually existed from almost 2600 BC to about 1250 BC. Their decline matched the rise of the, the around the same time as uh, rather the fall of the Mycenaean civilization. They overlapped one another. The Minoan civilization was extraordinary. The first civilization in Europe, and yet their architecture, their art, uh, they were a cultured people. They had no militaristic or military aspirations. They did not conquer, but they did travel extensively and traded uh, throughout the whole Aegean, through all the entire of the Eastern Mediterranean. Some of the different colonies we've been able to identify that they established in their trading. This is in the Aegean Sea from Crete to Akrotiri, which is on what we know as Santorini, used to be Thera, um, onto the uh, the Asia Minor coast, modern-day Turkey, onto other islands, and then even up into uh, mainland Greece. So they traveled extensively, they traded, they did not conquer, and that's one of the reasons they had difficulty surviving, um, because the next culture to come along was very militaristic. It, it uh, really emphasized their military capability and their arms, and that was the Mycenaean culture. Again, the whole period of time of the Mycenaean culture was longer, but primarily, they, they, their high point was about 1400 to 1100 BC, a very complex civilization. And you'll notice where it's located right here. This is Athens. For those of you, I'm gonna talk about this at the end, but those of you who are going to be in Greece and gonna have several days, in one day you can travel, if you get a guide, you can drive and visit the ruins of Corinth, famous uh, city right at the mouth of the Peloponnesian Peninsula right there and then down to Mycenae, where there are pretty spectacular ruins. This is what the city looked like in its heyday, the primary capital of Mycenae, the city of Mycenae. Um, they, the walls are still there. This is the famous Lion Gate. These are uh, carved into that gate, are two lion figures. This is my lovely wife, Carolyn, saying, and it's this high. Uh, they had some art. This is the treasury of Atreus, and again, you get some sense of this, the size of this thing. And, the size of these stones that they were able to raise very high in the air. Um, the mask of Agamemnon, which was found here, we don't believe that really was Agamemnon's mask now, but the person who found it was very dramatic about the whole thing. You can see that at the Archaeological Museum in Athens, if you go there, which is one of my favorite museums. 
So the Mycenaean culture was um, spectacular as well. These two, first Minoan and then Mycenaean cultures, were the, the predecessors and laid the foundation for Greek culture. This little chart gives you sort of a period of time that's important to understand how Greek culture developed. During the Mycenaean Greek civilization period, um, we were looking at about 1700 BCE, before Common Era, this chart uses that. The Trojan War, Some, a few, a very few of you uh, watched the movie Troy earlier, which is a, a fictionalized account of the Trojan War. Again, scholars thought that Troy never really existed until fairly recently, you know, the last uh, century and a half or so, and they discovered Troy. So they now know where it was, and they know it was real. That Homer, while he may have fictionalized it just like that movie did, that Homer, in writing the Iliad, one of the great classics, he was talking about a real place and uh, apparently a real conflict. There was a dark age that uh, the Greek culture suffered, this whole area, during which, after the Mycenaean culture, they went through a period where there was uh, extensive migration, there was warfare between tribal groups, poverty, isolation. What infrastructure had existed under the Minoan and Mycenaean cultures collapsed, and so it very much was a dark age. Um, and as they came out of that, we, we see the period between about 1100 BC and around 8 to 900 BC as the period of transition from the Mycenaean age to the Hellenic age. Remember, Greece is called Hellas in Greek. That's the name of their land. And so around 800 to 900 BC is the beginning of the Greek culture, a move toward the classical Greek civilization. Homer wrote his famous epics, the uh, Odyssey and the Iliad, somewhere around 750, in the eight, that is in the uh, 8th century BC. We really don't have any concept how important the writings of Homer were to the Greek culture. The Iliad, which is the story of the Trojan War, and the Odyssey, the story of a great pilgrimage, someone leaving and then returning home. Um, in those two books, Homer deals with, if, if you've never read the Odyssey and the Iliad, they still <laughs> inspire people and uh, captivate people even today, this much later. He deals with heroic actions, but not just these heroic myths, there's also feeling and thought and personality in his books. The characters are emotional, they're complex, um, and in these, Homer establishes three principles in his writing that became foundational to Greek and later Western thought. First, there is a sense in which all things, all things universally, have some kind of order. There is an order to the universe. It's not just chaos. Secondly, there's an emphasis in his writing on honor, on dignity, on bravery, and skill. Those are important values. And third, the, the primacy of the individual that while we may show respect to the gods, we still have the responsibility to decide what we're going to do with ourselves. Those three things became, as I say, foundational to Greek culture and also to Western culture as a whole. In fact, Homer provided the foundation for later uh, Olympian, the Olympian religious beliefs, the Olympian gods. The Iliad was the basis of all Greek education. The Greeks, after Homer, they used that book to teach everything, code of conduct, ethics, values, reading, everything was taught from Homer's writing. We have no concept of having anything, any single piece of literature that's been as influential in Western culture as Homer's writings were to the Greeks. Even scripture has not been as, as dominant in the Western society as Homer was to the Greeks. Uh, then around 800, in this same time period, we have the founding of the city of Sparta. And I need to tell you just a little bit about Sparta because they come up later in the, in the war with Athens. Sparta was founded around 800 BC. In 730 BC, the Spartans, the city of Sparta, conquered the nearby uh, province of Messina and they enslaved the whole population. They were called Helots, slaves. Well, about 80 years later, all of the Helots, the slaves of this region of Messina, rebelled against the Spartans. They suppressed that rebellion, but what it did was the Spartans were always fearful that their slaves, they had a whole people that were slaves to them, that the slaves would rebel again. And that led Sparta to create a culture that was entirely oriented around their military, so that they would always be prepared to uh, suppress any other revolt. They were ruled by a group of 28 men, all of whom were 60 years or older. So they had old men. These 28 
men, 60 years or older, were called the gerousia. It's from the same root where we get geriatric. Old people, right? Us, let's face it. Um, so these, uh, gerousia, this committee, they would, they did several things. When a baby was born in Sparta, because their whole orientation was around military, the gerousia, these old men, would come and inspect the baby. If they felt the baby wasn't strong enough, it had any deformity, there was anything about it that it wouldn't grow up to be a strong soldier or, or a mother to give birth to soldiers, they would take the baby out and leave it in the wilderness to die. If the baby was healthy, they would let, the, let them stay with their mother until age seven. The boys at that point were taken away from their mother and put in a communal school, and they were broken up by age group into what were called herds. And in this school, that these boys, seven years and older, were intentionally subjected to quite horrific hardships. They were given only a cloak to wear, no shoes. They were only allowed to sleep on reeds, and they could collect enough reeds for their bed once a year, and they had to sleep on those reeds on the ground. They were forced to, um, you know, whether on hard rocky soil or in the snow, to go barefoot. They pursued, they, they pushed them into intense competition, athletic competition, military training, and if anyone failed, whoever lost, they were ridiculed horribly. So much so that these young boys frequently committed suicide over the ridicule they experienced. Um, military training was the whole point. They intentionally underfed these boys because they wanted them either to have to go out and hunt on their own to survive or steal to survive. They encouraged that. Now, if they got caught stealing, they were quite badly whipped because you shouldn't get caught. It's not that stealing was wrong. They got whipped for getting caught. When these boys got to age 20, they graduated into what was called the cryptea, which was like the secret service. And one of the first things they had to do when they got to 20 and got into this cryptea is they had to sneak out into Messina or into places where the slaves, the Hellas lived, sneak up on one of them and kill them. And then... They were, they were accepted back into the Cryptea, back into Spartan society. It was a horrific way for a culture to live, all of it based upon the fear that their slaves would eventually rebel. So the Spartans were the most disciplined, the most militaristic, the best soldiers that existed in the world at that time. So Sparta, they come into play quite a bit. This chart, I'm not going to expect you to memorize all this, show some of the periods. The main period we want to look at is um, the around 500s, the dates are along the bottom here, is when the first Olympic Games, actually in the 700s, began. Homer was sometime around 750. This sort of orange section is what's called the classical period. That was when um, the Persian Wars are held. I'm going to mention the Peloponnesian Wars as well. That's when we have some of the great writers like Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides. That's when Plato is active. Aristophanes, another writer. This is the time period when Pericles, Athens comes to preeminence, and there is the golden era. Following that, the Macedonian army and Alexander conquer Egypt. So we have the, Hellen the uh, Hellenistic as opposed to the Hellenic classic period. The Hellenistic period under uh, Philip first and then uh, Alexander's son. Then we have the Greco-Roman period when the Romans come in, and then the Roman period. That's sort of how the history lines up. I'll give you a few dates here. I know you don't you don't care about dates, but they maybe give you something to hang your recollections on. After the Minoan and Mycenaean civilizations and the Trojan War around 1200, we have the Greek Dark Ages and then the growth of the city-states. How many of you all have ever traveled at all in Greece? What's the terrain like? Rocky. Rocky and mountainous. One of the reasons that they were city-states is because it was too hard to communicate between one area and another. And so within a valley, a city would be planted and it would grow and they would become their own government. They couldn't relate to people who were over those steep mountains. And that's why individual cities like Athens and Thebes and Corinth and Mycenae, why they became their own governments. In 776, they had the first Olympic Games. This was the recognition that while we may be our own government, our own city, we do need to have some kind of relationship with the people around us if for no other reason that we don't, we're not always trying to kill each other. And so they would get together, and the original Olympic Games were more than just athletics. They also would gather for, to hear orators, to um, have poets read, to, to share together in religious events, but still they were independent entities at that time. 
750s, we get Homer's epics. The geography, as I said, is very, very rough. Um, all of these different city-states, the major ones, Athens, Thebes, Corinth, uh, Sparta, Mycenae was declined by then, you know, had declined by then, but you get some idea of the, the spread here. In the 500s, around 594 to 508, they do something quite extraordinary in the, uh, the city-states. They develop democracy, particularly in Athens is where it began. Um, at that time, 594, they had been ruled primarily by an oligarchy, by a small group of wealthy men who just basically had control of everything. At that point, everyone was so frustrated with the way it was being done, they got together and decided that there was a man they respected as being honorable whose name was Salon. He became known as Salon the Reformer. They said, we want you to be in charge. And there was an uprising to put Salon in charge. Well. The first thing he did was he canceled all the debts because a huge number of people were in prison because they were in debt. He canceled all the debts and he let everyone out of prison who was in prison for reason of debt. He did not, despite the popular desire for this, he did not confiscate the lands of the wealthy people that had previously been in charge. He said, you get to keep your lands, we're gonna be fair to everybody. But he, for the first time, he permitted anyone, any free male citizen, to sit in the assembly that made the decisions for the government. Previously, you had to be wealthy. It was a small group of wealthy people, but now anyone, rich, poor, if they were male, <laughs> sorry ladies, if they were male and they were free, they had a right to sit on the assembly. He pursued very, a very rigorous economic reform, expansion of the government. He really established the first version of democracy. Now, over the next hundred years or so, they had several different versions of democracy they were kind of trying out. But in 508, a man named Cleisthenes becomes the leader in Athens, and he creates the first true democracy. He sets up an assembly of 500 people. They would have regular changes. Now, that 500 people were 50 free men from each of the 10 major tribes that existed in that area. So 50 times 10 tribes, 500. They would, be, they would change regularly, and the people who were put on were picked by random. It was a random selection. So everybody had an equal chance to be one of the people running the government. And that's how it's, it was sort of a true democracy. It was a republic in the sense that they had a group of people ruling it, but anybody could be on this. And eventually, virtually everybody was, at least every uh, male. They did another very interesting thing at that time. You know the word ostracize, right? You know where the word ostracize comes from? Cleisthenes introduced, he recognized that one of the problems in a city like Athens was that you periodically got somebody who was just a real troublemaker, who was creating problems for the government, for the people, you know, just being obnoxious. Once a year, they would have a, an election where people would take a piece of pottery. A pottery shard, like a broken pot, is called an ostraka in Greek. The Ostraka, people would take a piece of Ostraka and they would write the name of someone that they thought should be sent away out of the city. Not killed or anything, but just exiled. They would, every, every free citizen had a right to do that, men. They would write the names in, they'd put them all in a big pot, they'd go through and whoever got the most names on the Ostraka would be ostracized, meaning they had to leave. You can't live here anymore. So you didn't want to become too unpopular, you didn't want to push too hard, or you might be ostracized. So, fascinating times then. Um, this is the time in the 500s to the, the late 4th century when Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, the great playwrights and poets, people still do performances of things like Aristophanes, The Clouds, and others. They, they, these plays, they invented comedy. They invented tragedy. They invented dramatic literature. All of these things were Greek inventions. They came along during this time period. We then get to the Persian Wars, which I told you about some this morning, where um, the Ionian coast, which was along here, were Greek cities following the victory of the Greeks at Troy, and they kept rebelling against the Persian, their Persian masters. Finally, Darius, the king of Persia, came over to teach them a lesson, and he wanted to not only teach them a lesson, but Athens had been supporting the rebellion of the Ionian cities, so he launches his ships and he comes over here and to everyone's surprise at the Battle of Marathon, the uh, Athenians, with help from some other cities, defeat the awesome Persian army. 
not only did they defeat them, but in that, in that battle, the Battle of Marathon, 192 Greeks were killed, 6,400 Persians were killed. Pretty decisive. And nobody thought the, the Greeks had a chance. That's why the guy was so excited he ran 26 miles to tell everybody. So around this same time, Athens had discovered silver mines north. With that silver, they had a guy named uh, Themistocles who was a sailor, and he convinces the assembly that's ruling Athens that they need to take all that money from silver and build a navy, particularly what were in that day called triremes. They were the fastest, the most agile, the most effective warships of the day. So they built 200, 200 of these triremes with the silver they found, and they create a navy. In 480, when Darius's son Xerxes comes back to try to, you know, finally give the Greeks their comeuppance, they end up burning, uh, the, the Persians burn Athens, later on it's rebuilt, but they're unable to win victories against the, the navy that the Athenians have built. In fact, in 479, the Athenians defeat the Persians at the Battle of Salamis, which is right here, at navy, and the next year the Spartan land army defeats the Persians on land. And so the Persians finally are driven off, they go home. Interestingly, before the Persian battles, they had gone to Delphi. Have you been to Delphi? Fascinating place. The Delphian or Oracle. They went to this Oracle and said, what's going to happen? The Persians are coming back. And the Delphi Oracle said, trust in the wooden walls. Trust in the wooden walls. Some people thought that meant we need to build a wall, which later they did under Pericles around the city. But uh, Themistocles convinced them the wooden walls were the ships because the side of these large ships looked like large wooden walls. Well, it turned out that apparently was right because it was the ships that won the battle for them. So this victory over the Persians made the Athenians feel really good about themselves, and they started kind of controlling the people around them. They created what was called the Delian League, and it's because Athens got all the other cities, in fact, 120 different cities and islands, to contribute money to a common defense fund. That money was supposed to be used to defend against Persians if they came back, and also against pirates. And all of that money was kept at a treasury on the island of Delos, which is, oh, if I can see it, right here, I think. Um, that's why it was called the Delian League. Well, Athens insisted that people join this. A few years later, in fact, when the island of Naxos in 467 said, we don't want to do this anymore. We're tired of contributing money to this, particularly because everybody started becoming aware that the Athenians were freely dipping into that money that belonged to all of these 120 plus places and spending it on their own city because they were the strongest. Well, when the island of Naxos said, we don't want to be part of this anymore, the Athenians got on their warships and sailed out there and attacked them and suppressed them, the revolution of Naxos, as a way of saying, you guys don't have a choice anymore. You know, you're in this. Well, a few years later, in 461, Sparta, the strongest land army, got together with Corinth and others in the, Pen uh, the Peloponnesian Peninsula down here and formed the Peloponnesian League to oppose Athens. And at that point, Athens built what was, were called the Long Walls. They literally built a fortified wall all the way around the city of Athens and all the way to Piraeus, the coast, so that they could get to their ships since they were primarily a sea power. Sparta was trying to attack their walls with their powerful land army. The Athenians would go down to Piraeus behind the walls, get on their boats, and their navy would attack very, you know, various cities and, and the ships, the few ships the Spartans had. As I said this morning, people said it was like the battle between a whale and a, an elephant, a sea power and an earth po and land power. This did lead, however, despite the fact that they're fighting these wars, um, to the Peloponnesian Wars, and there were two periods with sort of a cold war in between. This led to what was called the Golden Age of Greece. In the middle of the Classical period, the Golden Age only lasted between 30 and 40 years. It was not a huge period of time. Under the leadership of Pericles, I mentioned this morning, the full development of art, of literature, that's when they used the money from the Delian League to build the Acropolis and all of the temples on the Acropolis. They rebuilt the city after it had been destroyed by the Persians, and it was a spectacular place. 
But because they were using money that wasn't really theirs, and because they were trying to force everybody else to continue funding the Delian League, the Spartans and the Athenians attack each other. They can't, neither one can get a victory. Then, to unfortunately for the Athenians in 430 BC, they're all locked behind their walls. They're all enclosed. A plague comes. And this plague kills one third of the population of Athens. And they're stuck behind their walls. Well, one of the people that died in that plague was Pericles. He was, the, he was a wise leader. He was the one that, he had various other soldiers that kept saying, let's go out and fight those Spartans. And he said, are you nuts? We're safe here, leave it alone. Well, when he died, other people came into leadership. There was a man named uh, Alcibiades. Alcibiades convinced them, we need to make some sort of gesture to prove that we're still powerful. So he convinced the leadership in Athens, the other leaders in Athens, to mount a campaign to go to Sicily. Sicily was another Greek colony. They sail a group of ships, actually 200 ships, to Sicily. They had borrowed, you know, they had other people from around that they had recruited. They send 50,000 men and 200 ships to Sicily. All of the men die and all of the ships are destroyed. It's a huge blow to Athens. At that point, Sparta besieges the walls more intently and without good leadership and after this terrible Sicilian disaster, the Athenians surrender. Sparta tears down the walls of Athens. They dismantle the Delian League and give everybody back their money. The Peloponnesian Wars are over, but the Peloponnesian Wars really crippled not only Athens, but the other city-states as well. And so the Golden Age, Pericles, the Acropolis, all of that ended fairly soon. We do have around this time Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but again, there was such a blow, that's one of the reasons that Socrates ended up uh, uh, poisoning, being poisoned, being executed because they were looking for people to blame for why things had all of a sudden gone wrong. And remember we talked earlier about people always want to blame somebody else? It's never my fault. It's never my people's fault. It's somebody else. Well, they blamed Socrates. And because they were so weakened by the later parts of the Peloponnesian War and the loss to Sparta, they were so weakened that when Philip II of Macedonia comes along in the 300s, they are unable to defend themselves. And when Philip gets there, the Macedonian period, he conquers all of Greece. Later on, Alexander, his son comes along after Philip dies. He reconquers to make sure that they're all under, uh, under control. And then he launches the Macedonian period where he conquers all the known world, as we talked about earlier. Philip, Alexander, another picture of Alexander, and we looked at these images this morning. This is how Greece came under the sway of the Macedonians. This was the entire of Alexander's uh, conquered kingdoms. This is Greece, right there. Some of the first places that Philip and then later Alexander reaffirmed this, conquered. So this is the destruction that came. That's all just a real, real quick, brief history of the important parts of, of Greece. But I want to talk now uh, specifically about what do we owe? I said that Greece, along with the Hebrew ethical monotheism, are critical principles that gave us Western civilization. So what do we owe to Greece? First, democracy. The word democracy is literally a Greek word that means people's rule. Not only did they give us a principle of democracy, but also the concept of individual rights and of freedom for citizens. That was new. Nobody really had a sense of that before. The, the Greeks invented that we take it for granted. We assume everybody understands that. But there was a period of time, 2,500 years ago, when they invented this. Secondly, they gave us philosophy. Again, a Greek word. Philosophy is Greek for love of wisdom. And that includes the invention of formal logic. If you ever took logic, and, and logic doesn't just mean thinking clearly. There is a formal logic, that there's a very systematic approach to it. It used to be one of the basic things people were taught in school. You have to take a special course now. But formal logic, reasoning, ethics, and again, in philosophy, we look to people like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc. In fact, Alfred North Whitehead, one of the greatest of the American philosophers, said that all philosophy is nothing but a footnote to Plato. That's how important these guys were. Everything, when we say, oh, come on, be logical or be reasonable, 
we are hearkening back to the tradition that we got from them, from the Greeks. Uh, we also got science from the Greeks. All science. Remember, these guys are, we're talking about a thousand years before the Golden Age of Islam. The Golden Age of Islam that we talked about the other day, they were trying to recapture and collect and collate much of what the Greeks had done. That was a big part of what they were doing. And so science, chemistry, physics, astronomy, biology, all of the sciences. In fact, 70% of, of the scientific terms that we use today, 70% of scientific terms have Greek as their root words. That's how significant the science was. Mathematics, Euclid, Archimedes, Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagoras is quite a character. You should read about him sometime. Um, his math was great. His other beliefs were wacky. But you know, we, we have principles like to find the, you know to find uh, some of the basic geometric things like pi, right? Three point one four one six one five. I don't know. Three point one four is what I remember. Why do you think it's called pi, which is a Greek letter? Because the Greeks are the one that discovered that. So mathematics, we rely on what the Greeks discovered. The Euclidean geometry, they actually call it Euclidean geometry because of Euclid. Um, history. History was invented, history as we know it, was invented by the Greeks. That is an objective chronological reporting of events it, without any moralizing or any showing of preference to one side or the other prior to Herodotus in the 5th century BC history was expected to be telling the story from the side of the guy who won and making him look really good and the other guy looking really bad. It didn't matter if it was true or not. Herodotus wrote the, the history of the Persian Wars. A short time later Thucydides comes along and he writes the history of the Peloponnesian Wars and then later Xenophon comes along as the third historian. These three, especially Herodotus and Thucydides, invented history as we understand it. Medicine. You've heard of Hippocrates? How many doctors do we have in the, in the in group? How many of you all are physicians? When you became a physician, did you say the Hippocratic Oath? They still swear doctors into the practice of medicine with the Hippocratic Oath, which Hippocrates, the Greek physician, wrote. The principles that they developed continue to be major principles throughout the history of medicine. First, do no harm, right? That's the start of the Hippocratic Oath. Literature and theater, they invented drama they, and theater. They invented tragedy and comedy. Homer, one of the greatest of all authors, we don't know anything about him. The tradition is that he was a blind uh, you know, storyteller. We don't really know. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, and on and on and on and on. The foundation for everything we take for granted in theater and in so much of the writing forms that we have today. Imagine what the world would be like without comedy. They invented it. Right? We think we, we take it for granted that it's natural, but it didn't really exist as a form until they created it. Um, sculpture and architecture, you all know the discus guy and all, all of that, all the beautiful forms of sculpture. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and you look at all these amazing buildings, what style is that? It's classical architecture, which is based upon Greek design. They discovered things like the golden mean which gives you the proportion that are necessary to make buildings look pleasing. So much of that we, we, we owe to the Greeks. And they gave us organized sports. We would not have a sense of organized athletic events were it not for them inventing it. I'm not saying nobody else could ever have come along and thought of that, but they did first, and we owe that to them. All of these things give an example of why while we get ethical monotheism and our sense of basic human dignity from the Hebrew history and the Hebrew faith, Judaism, we look at when we look at culture, intellectual pursuits, all of that, our, our way of thinking is fundamentally Greek. And we need to thank them for that. And it's quite astonishing when you think about it that they were not a great nation. It was individual cities. At its height, Athens had between 30 and 40,000 free male citizens. Most of the cities in ancient Greece had 5,000 free male citizens. That's why Athens was so powerful and so important. Well, we're headed there. This is us right about here, okay? <laughs> we are headed to Athens. 
and we will arrive there first thing tomorrow morning and you've all got your luggage tags and you're all prepared to get off the boat. When you get to Athens, I wanted to say again, the history of this city, while it's not as old as what we saw in Luxor, in fact, you went to the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, that's a thousand years older than the, um, the Acropolis, the Parthenon on the Acropolis. But our culture looks more back to this history than any other. And so when you go up on the Acropolis, uh, they said that the, the original idol, the statue there, which was partially gold, could be seen like 30 miles to sea. They could see the sun reflecting off that thing um, um, from the Acropolis. So you can go up there today, see the Parthenon. You know, this is the um, Odeon that is there where they used to have musical performances. Antiquities galore. And if you've never been up on the Acropolis, you really need to do so. In addition to the Acropolis, this is more what it looks like today, there is the new Acropolis Museum, uh, which, it, it, again, if you're first time or especially, it's worthwhile. It's an extraordinary museum. I've been to the Acropolis so many times, I'm a little worn out with the Acropolis. So my favorites are the Archaeological Museum, where you can see the Mask of Agamemnon, you can see some of the great statues that you saw in those textbooks back when you were in school. You can see the serpent goddess from the Minoan culture and, and just extraordinary things from all over that region. Um, we also, Carol and I really like the Byzantine Museum, which is not a very big museum, but it's extraordinary paintings and mosaics, icons, various other things. We, uh, I'm fascinated by, by the Byzantine history anyway, so we really enjoy that. Um, so if you are more than one day, if, if several people have said to me, I'm gonna, we're going to be there three or four days, what should we do? As I said, you've got one, you know, at least a day or two days that you can spend in Athens, depending on how energetic you are. And things are not that, very, that far apart in Athens. A lot of things are a fairly close walking distance, or you can take a fairly short taxi drive out to the, the archaeological museum. But from Athens, it is a day trip to go over around the Bay of Salamis, to Corinth, there are ruins in Corinth um, that, that you can visit. And then down to Mycenae, I showed you the pictures. You know, Carolyn standing under the Lion Gate and all of that. Uh, quite extraordinary things that you can see at Mycenae. And that's a day trip to go there and back if you have a guide. So I would recommend those things. If, you, if you've got more time and you're interested, you can go north and go up to Delphi, which is up on a mountainside, see the, uh, the navel of the, of the universe. They believe at Delphi there's a stone that's considered this, literally the center of the universe. Of course, there were three places I know of in the ancient world that thought they were the center of the universe. You know, one in Egypt, one in uh, Jerusalem, and then this one in Delphi. But extraordinary things to see, extraordinary history. Are there any questions that you have for me? Don't laugh. Yes? I just want to tie this in. Other things are going on in the ancient world at this time. Uh, in 586, the Babylonians destroyed the temple, and the Jews are exiled to Babylon. Right. And then uh, the Persians are defeat the Babylonians, and so they're the big power. Not Cyrus, the Persian king, lets the Jews go back uh, to to Israel, but not everyone goes back. The big Jewish community in Persia, Babylon. So, in the book of Esther. Uh, it talks about a king, that you can hardly pronounce the name, is Ahasuerus, and uh, he, Esther and Ahasuerus are the, um, are the people in the book of Esther. And who is Ahasuerus? He is Xerxes II. Right. He's the guy. That got that, defeated. That got defeated. <laughs> so you see the combination with Esther, Xerxes II. Right. This is the the age when that, those things are going on. I don't know if you all can hear that, but um, Arnie's making the point that in the Hebrew Bible, in the Book of Esther, um, well, in 586 the Jews were conquered. Jerusalem was conquered and destroyed. The temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. They were taken into captivity. Somewhat a little less than 50 years later, the Babylonian Empire was defeated by the Persians. And so they allowed the Jews to return. Not all of them did. There was still a community. And the book of Esther in the Hebrew Bible is the story of Esther, a, a Jewish woman who becomes queen. And her husband is Xerxes II that was involved in being defeated uh, at the Battle of Salamis and then on land by the Spartan army the year later. So all of this does tie in together. Okay, the history is... 
this really happened. <laughs> you know, sometimes it feels like these are just stories, but this is these aren't just stories. This is history. Yes, yes, yes. And it all weaves together. It's all it's all consistent. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Yes. Michelle. We've talked about lots and lots of civilizations and they rose and they had their glorious <laughs> period and they fell. Is that inevitable? Must all <laughs> civilizations fall? Are the question is all these civilizations rose, they were extraordinarily powerful, they did amazing things, and then they fell. I'm adding to, to your comment, Michelle, sorry. Um, is that inevitable? <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least based upon any history, well, based upon any history, every culture that has ever existed, every civilization, especially the grand ones, the Assyrians, twice, the Babylonians, twice, the Egyptians, for 3,000 years, they all assumed that they were forever. No one ever has been yet. And Where are we in the, in the slump? Well, I don't, I don't think we're in the decline. Actually, I'm going to recommend a book to you, and I, don't, I can't remember the author, but I was talking to a couple people about this. There's a book called The Next Hundred Years. The fellow who writes it, The Next Hundred Years. I can't tell you the author because I don't remember. But um, he is a, a futurist. He specializes in being able to look at the geopolitical uh, realities around the world and say what's going to happen. He's a major consultant to the US government as well as major corporations. Well, in this book, he says, I'll reassure all you Americans here, he says that the primary thing that uh, makes a difference in the world today is the ability to control the oceans because the vast majority of product is travels by sea. We think about airplanes, but it all travels in ships. Well, the United States has without any question or, you know, or challenger by far the most powerful deep water navy in the world there's nowhere on the planet that the United States cannot go and if anybody starts creating too much of a ruckus you know then the US at least for the next hundred years will have the power to control that situation because the Navy is most important the Navy obviously is you know there are ships on, on board uh, uh, planes on board ships now there are drones there are um, missiles all kinds of stuff but anyway so there's no question the United States will continue to be the most powerful nation in the world throughout this next hundred years, until 2100. There will be a couple of countries, this guy predicts, that will become world, world powers economically, maybe not militarily. Those two countries particularly are Turkey, because Turkey is entirely self-sufficient. They don't import any food. They have access to the Mediterranean. Um, and until very recently, with Erdogan, everybody sort of scratching their, you know, their chin. But they have been very stable. And the other one is, surprise, surprise, Mexico. And the reason for that is because, you know, once they get some things settled down, Mexico is one of the few countries in the world, like the United States and Canada, that have access to the, both of the great oceans of the world. And so they can trade in both directions. It's a fascinating book. I would recommend it to you. Uh, you know, I, who doesn't want to say, well, no, our country's going to last forever. All I can say is, historically, the odds are nil that <laughs> any power will remain a world power forever okay and we've only been around for a blink of an eye I mean Egypt was around for over 3,000 years and we've been here for 200 and, a, and change hopefully we'll last longer than you know next Tuesday but we'll see what happens <laughs> and I'm not being I, I'm you know I'm patriotic I you know I I really want I want us to last for all I want the red white and blue to be waving for a long time looking at it historically and culturally there's never been a case where a culture has continued forever. Now, there have been elements of, a pe of peoples, you know, the Jewish people have maintained for thousands of years as a people. They haven't been a power or a nation for all that time, but they maintained as a people. And so, yeah, we'll see. Any other questions? What's that? Oh, yes, I couldn't see your hand. Yeah. There's another book, The Rise and Fall of Great Empires. Okay. Including chapters of, of, about the United States and Russia and China on the decline. All right. The rise and fall of great empires. That, that yeah, talk about the U.S., Russia, and China on the decline. You know, we'll see. The so you know, Hitler thought he was good. Who's building fleets right now? Yep. Okay. Good. I have to read that. I haven't read it. Let me say how gratified I am for you all attending, all of you attending all of these lectures. I'm, I'm sure it's been exhausting from your side. 
And also for all of the affirmation you have given me, it has been a great joy for me to be part of this. We are so pleased with all the relationships we've developed. I hope we can stay in contact with you all and uh, come visit us in Mexico sometime. And at some point in the future, I hope to be on another Windstar cruise with you. All right? God bless you all.